friends, let us stand. Let us stand. O God, who by the passion of Christ your Son, our Lord, abolished the death inherited from ancient sin by every succeeding generation, grant that just as being conformed to him, we have borne by the law of nature the image of the man of earth, so by the sanctification of grace we may bear the image of the man of heaven through Christ our Lord. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the sons of man. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them they shall see, and that which had not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before the Lord like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, each has turned to their own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, Yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, he did not open his mouth. But a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. 
They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him, the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of anguish, he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a position with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. 
Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he has heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, because of the length of the gospel, as we hear the passion, we are invited to be seated and attentive to God's saving action. The passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. After they had eaten the supper, Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stood back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that had been spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom he gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the women who guarded the gate, and they brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? Peter said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, 
I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warning himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again Peter denied it, and at that moment the cock crowed. Jesus, remember me. took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual of defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have banded him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your laws. They replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked, Are you the king of the Jews? Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. So you are a king. You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. What is truth? After he had said this, Pilate went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you on the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. They took Pilate, Pilate took Jesus, and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. They answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now, when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? 
you would have no power over me unless it has been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Golgotha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. Pilate said to Jesus, to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then Pilate handed Jesus over to them to be crucified, so they took Jesus. Jesus, remember me. He went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with two others, with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put it on the cross. It reads, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the people read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast, they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, Standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother, and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, in order to fulfill the scripture, he said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Let us stand.
since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified, so that you may also believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, They will take, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, thought a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, allowing about, weighing about a hundred weight. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloth, according to the burial customs of the Jews. Now, there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb, in which no one had ever been laid. So and so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Let us be seated. Dear people of God, on Sunday, we heard Luke's account, the greatest act of love the world will ever see. Today, Holy Mother Church gives us John's account. And just as on Sunday, I invited us to really focus on the words of Jesus, once again, I want us to focus on the words of Jesus. First, we hear of him being targeted, an innocent man. Jesus doesn't run from the cross. Whom are you looking for? I am he. Jesus was not overtaken by the power of evil, my brothers and sisters. He willingly gave himself for your salvation and for mine. How often are we willing to be like Christ, to stand up for justice, to stand up for those who are oppressed, to actually live Christianity, not just say Christianity. Put back your sword into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? Jesus is willing to lay down his life as the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Jesus refers to himself as the way, the truth, and the life. And throughout his ministry, in all four Gospels, we see that Jesus speaks of truth. He was not worried about public perception. He hung out with tax collectors and sinners and was proud of it. These are my children. Is this true of us, my brothers and sisters? The truth of the Lord Jesus, is this the basis for which you and I live our lives? 
What are the truths that we dismiss because it might make us a little bit uncomfortable? Are we not like the Jews and the religious leaders of Jesus' time, pushing him? We don't like what he has to say. Let's get rid of him. And Jesus stands true to the truth. The power of evil, his upcoming crucifixion, does not scare the Lord. Does he not say to us 365 times in the Gospels, do not be afraid? Jesus is not afraid. As I said to the children this morning, Jesus is never afraid. He is our hero. He is the one who spills his blood for your salvation and for mine. Are you the king of the Jews? Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Jesus points us to where the kingdom is to come. Everything on earth, everything we do, should be leading us to the kingdom. If we're going to live as his disciples, my words, my thoughts, my actions, they must all suggest that I'm preparing for the kingdom. Just as we pray in the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come. At every single Mass, do we not say, we anticipate the coming of the Lord. And it is because of this salvific act that the kingdom has come. You refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? Hmm. You would have no power over me unless it has been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. Again, in the face of adversity, Jesus teaches us how we are to respond, my brothers and sisters. Never in fear. When we know that God is on our side, we have nothing to be afraid of. The devil and all of powers of evil hold nothing to Jesus. Pain, suffering, family dysfunction, economic turmoil, terrorism, violence, nothing can separate us from the love of God, as St. Paul reminds us. Jesus shows us, do not be afraid, my sons and daughters. I am with you as he says at the ascension, until the end of the age. Away with him. Away with him. Crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? We have no king but Caesar. Friends, how many times are we guilty of placing something or someone before God. All throughout Lent, our beautiful parish mission of rediscovering Jesus, Matthew Kelly has done a powerful job as an instrument of the Holy Spirit to remind us that Jesus needs to be numero uno, the first. Tomorrow, Matthew will challenge us, spoiler alert, spending time in the church in quiet prayer whether it is in the glorious moment of Eucharistic adoration or just being in the presence of God and recognizing Emmanuel. God is with us. God needs to be number one. And in his uttermost agony, when Jesus could be focusing on his own suffering, he thinks of us from the cross. As I depart from the world, 
my disciples will be lost. And so what does he do? He looks down and sees his mother, the faithful disciple. And he gives our blessed mother to us. Woman, here is your son. And John, representing the church, each one of us as individuals and as a collective, John, here is your mother. Mama Mary continues to teach us what it means to be at the base of the cross with all of our trials and tribulations, my brothers and sisters. Not to be focused on self, for there is no greater love, says the Lord, than to lay down one's life for a friend. I no longer call you slave, but friend. These powerful words of Jesus touch our hearts like no other words could. No hallmark card, no poem, no feel-good stories have the power of Jesus, for he is God. And he puts his money where his mouth is. Even in his uttermost agony, he's thinking of other. He's thinking of you. Then he cries out, I am thirsty. Jesus thirsts for your soul and for mine. As you've heard me preach many times, we've had amazing priests in our diocese who have shaped your faith and mine. And if you come from other dioceses, them too. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I agree. Priests that have shaped us, Father Montague, the words that will never leave me unless my mind goes. Rico, I want you to look at the crucifix and remember that as he was hanging from the cross, he was thinking of you. I am thirsty as the Lord is thirsting for your soul, my brothers and sisters in Christ. You mean so much to Jesus that if you were the only soul to redeem, he would have done it. Why? Because Jesus is thirsting for your soul. He wants to spend eternity with you. He wants to spend eternity with you. And then, three simple words before he gives up his spirit. It is finished. The master's plan has come to completion as the Savior bows his head and gives his spirit to his heavenly Father. I love Mel Gibson's film that I always watch on Good Friday, The Terror in the Devil. He thought he won, and he realizes he has lost. Why? Because it is finished. God's plan. All of heaven and earth rejoice. That's why today is Good Friday. As I taught our little friends this morning. Okay, Father, they got it. Do we get it? It is finished. This didn't happen by accident. Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen, and he willingly gave up his life for your soul. This attitude of gratitude that, please God, we are all experiencing today, my brothers and sisters, is one that needs to follow us every day of our life as we look upon the crucifixes in our home, not as decoration, but daily reminders that when I sin, I make Jesus sad. When I choose holiness, I make the Savior happy. How are your words and mine? How are your thoughts and mine? How are your behaviors and mine? as we leave this holy place, as we give honor and praise to God for his salvific action, his beautiful expression of love for you, how is that going to transform us so we can rediscover Jesus, that we can fall in love with our Messiah and be transformed so that we too, at the end of our life, 
can say the same words as the Lord has said. Lord, I give my life into your hands. May your will for me each and every day, no matter how hard or how beautiful it is, may my will be conformed with your will, O God, so that we too will enter into the kingdom prepared for us since the foundation of the world. It is finished. God reigns. Let it transform us. May it inspire us. May it change us from sinner to saint. My brothers and sisters in Christ, during these solemn intercessions, the church invites us to kneel as we kneel at the foot of the cross and pray for our brothers and sisters throughout the world. At the end of each petition, we are invited to sing, for the sake of your Son, have mercy, Lord. Let us kneel. For Holy Church, let us pray, dearly beloved, for the Holy Church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her, and to unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that, leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God the Father Almighty. For the sake of your Son, have mercy, Lord. For the sake of your Son, have mercy, Lord. Almighty, ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations, watch over the works of your mercy, that your church spread throughout the world may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name through Christ our Lord. Amen. For the Pope, let us pray also for our Most Holy Father, Pope Francis, that our God and Lord, who chose him for the order of bishops, may keep him safe and untarmed for the Lord's Holy Church to govern the holy people of God. We pray to the Lord. For the sake of your Son, have mercy, Lord. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favor on our prayers, and in your kindness protect Pope Francis chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by you their Maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. For all orders and decrees of the faithful, let us pray also for our Bishop Gerard Bergy, for all bishops, priests, deacons, and religious of the church, and for the whole of the faithful people. For the sake of your Son, have mercy, Lord. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose Spirit the whole body of the Church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace all may serve you faithfully. 
through Christ our Lord. Amen. For catechumens, let us pray also for catechumens that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their innermost heart and unlock the gates of his mercy that, having received forgiveness of all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. We pray to the Lord for, for the sake of your Son. Have, have mercy, Lord. Lord. Almighty ever-living God, who make your church ever fruitful with new offspring, increase the faith and understanding of catechumens, that reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. For the unity of Christians, let us pray also for all our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth to gather them together and keep them in his one church. We pray to the Lord for, for the sake of your Son. Have mercy, Lord. Almighty ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity through Christ our Lord. Amen. For the Jewish people, let us pray also for the Jewish people to whom the Lord our God spoke first that he may grant them to achieve advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. We pray to the Lord for, for the sake of your Son. Have, have mercy, Lord. Lord. Almighty ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, Graciously hear the prayers of your church, that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. Amen. For those who do not believe in Christ, let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ that, enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. We pray to the Lord for, for the sake of your Son. Have mercy, Lord. Almighty ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart they may find truth and that we ourselves, being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. For those who do not believe in God, let us pray for those who do not acknowledge God that following what is right in sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. We pray to the Lord for, for the sake of your Son. Have mercy, Lord. Lord. Almighty ever-living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you, Come to rest, grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love 
and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you. And so in gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of our human race, through Christ our Lord. Amen. For those in public office, let us pray also for those in public office that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will for the true peace and freedom of all. We pray to the Lord. For, for the sake of your Son, have mercy, Lord. Almighty ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of peoples, Look with favor, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world, the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace, and freedom of religion may through your gift be made secure, through Christ our Lord. Amen. For those in tribulation, let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to traveling safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. We pray to the Lord. For the sake of your Son, have mercy, Lord. Almighty, ever-living God, comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil, may the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, especially our brothers and sisters, in Ukraine, Russia, and other parts of the war-torn world, that all may rejoice, because in their hour of need, your mercy was at hand, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us be seated. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world. Come, let us adore. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world. Come, let us adore. Behold the wood of the cross, on which hung the salvation of the world. Come, let us adore. My brothers and sisters, each of us now have an opportunity to come and venerate the cross, the cross of our salvation. This year as we continue in time of pandemic, I invite you, please do not kiss the cross, but you are welcome to touch the cross. You may bow to the cross, or you may genuflect to the cross. We do so reverently as we join in the hymns as we await each of us to reverence the wood by which our salvation was given.
Surely he has borne our tears, his wounds.
brothers and sisters, we now move to prepare our hearts to receive Jesus in Holy Communion. We join in our offertory hymn. The collection will not take place at this time. As you leave the church, the boxes in the foyer will go to support our Christian brothers and sisters in the Holy Land. So please be generous in your offering as we now sing. Neil. Let us stand. At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Let us kneel. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. May 
the receiving of your body and blood, Lord Jesus Christ, not bring us to judgment and condemnation, but through your loving mercy be for us protection in mind and body and a healing remedy. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. Christ bring us all to everlasting life. Amen. For those who are visitors to our parish, we continue to receive Jesus reverently on our hands. We do not receive him on the tongue at this time. After Deacon John and I say the body of Christ, you remove your mask and receive Jesus reverently for those who are wearing masks and then return to your pews. Thank you.
Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ, preserve in us the work of your mercy, that by partaking of this mystery, we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Bow your head for God's blessing. May abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honored the death of your Son and the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure through Christ our Lord. Friends, just as we did on Sunday, we depart in silence. After Deacon John and I have processed out, you are invited to genuflect to the cross and then return home. Again, the boxes there are for the offerings for our collection taken up for our brothers and sisters in the Holy Land. Please do not visit with one another, but enter into the sacredness of today. Thank you. Tonight, Stations of the Cross, we will pray Mary's Way of the Cross at 7 p.m.